operate my own geotechnical engineering firm in Portland right now. Uh, but I've been coordinating with Paulo and Steve and, and John at UCLA to help ed provide additional contributions to this next generation liquefaction project. And as Tom mentioned, I'm focusing on recorded ground motions that have been affected by liquefied soils. So past research has focused on the binary observation of surficial manifestation. So we'll go to a site, did we see liquefaction or did we not see liquefaction? And that's a binary classification, kind of a yes or no observation. Um, focusing on case histories where we did in see, indeed see liquefaction, Seed and Idris compiled 35 case histories. More recently, Chetan et al. has compiled 100, 109. Uh, Rod Kayan uh, has compiled 207 case histories related to shear wave velocity profiles. And these are all um, observations where we did indeed see liquefaction. As part of this next generation liquefaction project, we're hoping to compile possibly hundreds more from the Christchurch into Hoku earthquakes. Historically, there's been a limited observation of case histories where we actually have recorded ground motion. So we can actually see what's happening once soils liquefy. Um, Boulanger and Idris in their SPT-based liquefaction procedure had five observations. Uh, we've started collecting more. Gingery uh, identified 19 ground motions, and seven of those were from Japan. I'm focusing most of my investigation uh, at sites in Japan. There's a wealth of data there. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So why are these so valuable? Why are these, these particular sites uh, so important for our liquefaction triggering and our understanding of the effects or consequences of liquefaction? Well, of course, we can directly measure the intensity of shaking at the ground surface at these sites. Usually, we have to estimate uh, intensity measures based on ground motion prediction equations or shake maps. Um, in these cases, we have direct measurements. And they've been affected by the development of pore pressure, yes. We can identify that. This is a good place to start looking at what's the intensity of shaking that can trigger liquefaction. We can use these motions to isolate the, um, the ground motions before and after liquefaction has been triggered and possibly focus on um, the behavior of liquefied soil. So if we know the portion of the ground motion that's been um, after liquefaction has occurred, we can really identify kind of the characteristics of this liquefied soil. It's a difficult um, material to understand, and uh, these, these help us get a little bit more understanding of the liquefiable soils. And of course, we can observe some of the consequences. So spectral acceleration, uh, changes to spectral acceleration in these ground motions, again, use them for liquefaction trigger analysis, and these have been a workhorse for constitutive modeling and calibration Don, John talked about the um, Port Island sites and the wildlife site. Many researchers, researchers have used these in kind of their understanding of constitutive modeling. So in Japan, one of the earliest uh, case histories of recorded ground motion is, of course, this Kawagishi Cho apartment buildings. Um, there was an accelerometer or a strong motion recorder in the basement of one of the buildings. And we see a waveform that looks like this, where early on in the motion we have these high-frequency uh, motions, these very uh, you know, short period uh, spikes, and then at some point, right around 10 seconds, the motion shifts to a very low frequency ground motion. This is once the soil is liquefied, it can no longer transmit high frequencies to the ground surface, and low frequencies are amplified. It's a, it's a simple um, transfer function type of concept. We've been developing time frequency tools to evaluate these changes in frequency content over time. So based on this uh, Stockwell spectrum, if we normalize it at every time step, we get the peak amplitude at each time. That's the modal frequency. That's the peak frequency at that instant. Uh, here I'm showing a just a frequency sweep, showing that this normalized Stockwell spectrum has a nice tight band around the frequency of the ground motion as it's evolving with time. So this is a good balance between resolution in time, which the wavelet transform does a good job of, and resolution in frequency, which the um, short time Fourier transform does a, does a good job of. For liquefaction triggering, we're very interested in rapid changes in frequency content. So here I'm just showing three different um, parts of uh, three different sine waves. 
um, changes in frequency content, and this normalized Stockwell spectrum does a good job of detecting both the changes in frequency and the frequency of that ground motion. When I look at the Kawagishi Cho apartment building waveform here, we see that, yes indeed, at about 10 seconds, there is this rapid drop in frequency content. So all the high frequencies are filtered out by this liquefied soil, and the low frequencies are amplified. Once we know the time at which liquefaction has been triggered, we can isolate the intensity of shaking before liquefaction is triggered. Rather than using these binary observations of yes, no, did liquefaction occur, um, and doing some Bayesian inference, we can actually measure the intensity of shaking that caused liquefaction directly using this. We can also isolate the behavior of soil in its liquefied state. So liquefied soil is very difficult to work with in the laboratory. It's very, very soft. Um, small anisotropies in the laboratory equipment uh, make it difficult to look at. But this we have a full-scale, real-world um, observation of what liquefied soils are doing. So I focus kind of our study on uh, Japan. Japan has a very dense network of strong motion recorders. These are just uh, the, the strong motion recorders from the KickNet and KNet arrays. There's many other networks in Japan. Um, PARI has an array. Um, the Japanese Meteorological Society has an array. Many gas stations and other private entities have their own strong motion um, recording yes. networks. Sorry, networks, not arrays. I've identified 18 sites where, um, from the available sources where I have seen liquefaction recorded in actual ground motions. So there's this 1964 uh, Kawashiki Cho apartment buildings. In the north of Honshu, we see um, liquefaction occurring multiple times in some sites. So at Amori, uh, liquefaction was observed both during the 1968 Takachi-Oki and the 1983 Nihon Kaichubu earthquake. Um, so we see instances of liquefaction multiple times and recorded motions from, from these. So we can isolate uh, the, uh, the ground motion from some of the soil characteristics. Of course, during the Kobe earthquake, there was many instances of liquefaction in very loose soils, um, very strong uh, shaking from a crustal earthquake. Uh, again, at Kishiro Port in um, Hokkaido, we see liquefaction multiple times uh, during several different earthquakes. And I've been able to identify potential case histories that, um, or potential instances where where liquefaction was not necessarily documented, but we see these changes in frequency content during strong motions that may indicate liquefaction. So possibly a remote sensing um, observations we can do with these recorded motions. Uh, crustal motions, um, Western Totori, and of course we see we have many instances of liquefaction during the Tohoku earthquake. So from these uh, Japanese case histories, we have a pretty good range of earthquake moment magnitudes including some very powerful but uh, lower magnitude uh, crustal earthquakes, all the way up to uh, magnitude 9.1 Tohoku events, also occurring at very large, long rupture distances. So um, the potential for looking at very long duration ground motions as well, which was kind of the topic of my dissertation, which is why I'm interested in this. Um, so we have this data set. Let's look at a couple uh, case histories and um, see what kind of the, what information we can get from these types of uh, observations. So that Kishiro port I mentioned earlier on Hokkaido, uh, liquefied potentially in multiple earthquakes. This uh, site is located just outside of an area of, of a filled area. It's on native soil. The profile of the site is characterized by um, relatively loose soils above the groundwater table, but immediately below the groundwater table we have medium dense uh, silty sand. So from about two meters to seven meters, there's medium dense silty sand. So these are, these are not your typical very loose sands, but they're um, susceptible to liquefaction and uh, could potentially liquefy, particularly during very strong shaking. So the Kishiro Oki earthquake in 1993 produced very strong shaking at this, this station. Um, one of the unique things about some of these records is that we have downhole motion. So there's accelerometers in boreholes. Uh, this one happened to have a, um, a triaxial accelerometer at a depth of 77 meters. And we see in this uh, Kishiro-Oki earthquake that the 
P waves arrive, or S waves arrive right around um, 17 seconds or so. But then afterwards, we have relatively stationary behavior. So we don't see a rapid change in the frequency content of the motion. Um, it's relatively consistent around 6 hertz. But when we look at the ground surface, we see a rapid drop in the frequency content of the motion. Um, so the strong shaking caused liquefaction. Um, the liquefied soil is very soft, can no longer transmit high frequencies to the ground surface. Low frequencies are amplified. And we see the shift in the frequency content of the motion. Um, one unique thing about doing this is after liquefaction, we can see these very strong spiky dilation pulses. These actually produce the peak ground acceleration and also occur at, kind of, at semi-regular intervals and can produce strong spectral acceleration uh, at these intervals. Looking at the um, spectral acceleration, relative to the downhole accelerometer relative to the ground surface, we see very big amplifications at the period of those dilation pulses. So amplifications greater than a factor of five. Um, the peak ground acceleration also occurred after liquefaction is triggered. So there's the potential in these medium dense or dense soils once they liquefy to dilate during hot periods of high shear strain and can transmit, um, can, can transmit high frequencies again. So um, there's documented evidence of liquefaction occurring at this Kashiro uh, port ground motion station during both the Kashiro Oki earthquake and the 2003 Tokachi earthquake. Well, looking through the uh, recorded data at this station, we can find other potential instances of liquefaction. So during the 1994 Hokkaido Toho Oki earthquake, this was a very, very distant earthquake, um, relatively far away from, from Hokkaido. There was documented evidence of liquefaction in the port of Kashiro during this earthquake, but no one went out to visit the strong motion recorder to see yes or no, did we have liquefaction. But when we look at the recorded motion, we see a rapid drop in the frequency content of the motion, again, around 48 seconds. This could potentially indicate that liquefaction was triggered. Um, there's more work to do to kind of develop a uh, robust liquefaction triggering procedure using this type of approach. But we can see um, that there is potential to kind of comb through the database and potentially find more instances of liquefaction at recorded ground motions without necessarily going out and doing a, doing a recon afterwards. Um, one more site I just want to take a quick look at here, uh, Miyagi 13, uh, which liquefied during the Tuhoku earthquake. It's kind of in the interior Sendai at a fire station. The subsurface profile consists of about one meter of fill, followed by very soft organic silt and peat down to a depth of about four and a half meters and then about a meter and a half of medium dense gravel. This is kind of silty gravel, um, silty sandy gravel, uh, medium dense, saturated. It's susceptible to liquefaction, um, but it's, it's still gravel. So a practical refusal was encountered with these SPTs in the cone at a depth of about six meters. But there's a, there's a relatively thin layer, about a meter and a half thick of uh, gravel that could potentially liquefy. And indeed, when reconnaissance went out after the Tohoku earthquake, we see some minor uh, evidence of liquefaction or minor, co minor consequences of liquefaction. Uh, some ground cracks in the parking lot, ejecta by the strong motion station. Looking at the Stockwell spectrum, we see a rapid shift in the frequency content at about 35 or 40 seconds. That's actually the first arrival of S waves relative to the P waves we see another drop in the frequency content right around 47 seconds. So that's actually when uh, liquefaction was triggered. And again, afterwards, we see these very intense high frequency dilation pulses during the um, second period of strong shaking. So this was the Tohoku earthquake. Um, many of these waveforms we see have two very strong um, periods of strong shaking as the multiple asperities rupture. And during the second period of um, strong shaking, this liquefied soil produced very high, uh, very intense, greater than one and a half G dilation pulses. We don't have a uh, downhole strong motion recorder at this particular station, but based on event adjusted GMPEs, we can kind of look at what the, uh, what's the amplification of the liquefied soil. We see the peak ground acceleration is amplified, but we also see very strong amplifications 
at a period of about one second. Um, these are amplifications in the order of three and a half to four uh, due to these liquefied soils. So we can use these recorded ground motions to kind of see inside of the site or use numerical analyses to see if we can reproduce these recorded ground motions to really help us understand what happened at the site. Uh, I use the Japanese finite element program FLIP. I, this is the wrong room to talk about the virtues of FLIP. I swear next time I'll use open seas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my bad. <laughs> um, but we can select motions that are consistent with uh, the, you know, other stations near, that, that recorded ground motions nearby, input that into the base of the model, and evaluate the pore pressure generation in this layer of, of uh, medium dense gravel. And just like John was saying earlier, it's really a, um, it's, it's as much of a hydraulic problem as it is a material or a uh, soil material problem. So in this case, when we run these finite element analyses, we see pore pressure was generated during strong shaking at this the upper layer of this gravel, on the upper meter and a half, but then pore pressures dissipated as the intensity of shaking diminished. So as these pore pressures dissipate, high frequencies can be transmitted again, and we see the dilation pulses, or these very strong pulses, um, in the numerical model as well. So that's an important thing when we're doing numerical modeling, to be able to capture the cycles of contraction and dilation uh, as we're doing this. It's also important to capture the hydraulic behavior of this. And these are all kind of observations um, we're, we're looking at as we're comparing these to the recorded ground motion. So if we run this as an undrained model, we don't allow pore pressure to communicate between the different elements the peak ground acceleration is much too low. Likewise, if I turn the um, hydraulic conductivity up too high and pore pressures dissipate too rapidly, the peak ground acceleration actually becomes um, higher than we saw in the recorded ground motion. So these are great um, tools to look at. Uh, what, where, are, where should we be um, determined, or what parameters are important for numerical modeling for future prediction? is really what we want to get out of all of this. If I tune the hydraulic conductivity around and, and change some soil parameters, I can match that peak ground acceleration. So it's not an anomaly. We don't need one and a half G uh, acceleration at this site. It's not an anomaly. It's actually just a function of the uh, site behavior and some of the hydraulic conductivity of the, uh, of the soils. So just to kind of summarize everything, um, in this next generation liquefaction database, we're going to contribute 18 additional uh, case histories from locations where uh, ground motions were recorded in Japan. And these re recorded ground motions have great value. We can isolate the behavior of the soil both before and after liquefaction was triggered. Once we identify the time of liquefaction, we can directly measure the intensity of shaking that triggers liquefaction, and we can also isolate the post-triggering behavior. Um, and in this liquefied soil, we can observe phenomena that are difficult to reproduce in the lab. So drainage and pore pressure dissipation during shaking, continued degradation of the soil fabric, and dilation of dense soils. We can use uh, these recorded motions to validate uh, liquefaction observations. If there's some question of whether liquefaction occurred or not, uh, this is another tool. If we have recorded ground motions, we can identify, um, it can help us understand what happened at the site. Um, these can also potentially help us uncover new case histories of liquefaction where we might not necessarily have superficial observation of liquefaction. For example, um, I'm very interested in liquefaction of deeper soils, particularly for bridge piers and piles, things like that. You know, this is a real concern. Our, our uh, database is primarily composed of shallow, of liquefaction in shallower soils. We need to get a good understanding of what happens um, when soils liquefy relatively deep. And um, we can also identify case histories where liquefaction is, where reconnaissance is not possible. We have recordings of ground motions that were inundated by the tsunami after the Tohoku earthquake, uh, removing any evidence of liquefaction, superficial evidence. But we could possibly identify these uh, using this kind of time frequency based analysis. So that wraps up my talk. Thanks for uh, listening.
Questions? Have you looked at things like CAV in terms of characterizing emotions and what insights do you have from that? So, I've been focusing mostly on um, kind of the development of the, the uh, NGL database. Um, the goal eventually is to use these to develop models. So we have these recorded ground motions. Uh, they can be you know, a good supplement to our traditional ways of these uh, binary observations with Bayesian inference. Um, and CAV could potentially be a good metric of liquefaction triggering. Um, more likely, the, uh, you know, these, after liquefaction is triggered, uh, we see these big kind of low frequency things. CAV is more closely correlated with low frequency ground motions than PGA or, or areas intensity, something like that. So um, liquefied soils you know, are gonna amplify the CAV. Um, but in terms of liquefaction triggering, as Paula was talking about before, we're gonna develop the database, kind of get all the data in there. Uh, we've been kind of looking at these uh, identifying liquefiable sites as well with these uh, time frequency analysis, and, and we'll use that down the road to predict liquefaction triggering using different intensity measures.